Uh, hello and welcome back to the Donahue Group. We're glad you could be with us. Uh, it's a lovely hot summer day outside, kind of cool in the studio, at least for a little while. Welcome you back to our show where we talk over just uh, events in the city, the county, and the state. Joining me today, Cal Potter, Tom Paneski, and Ken Risto. Um, the, we thought we'd talk a little bit about interesting events in the city. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the police station continues to be with us. Um, someday, somewhere, there's going to be a police station, we assume. Uh, the current plan now, is, to, as I understand it, is to investigate five sites doing a public hearing. Think it's a good idea to have the public hearings, or has enough been said? What do you think? Well, I think the problem initially was that the park was taken without a lot of public uh, support, and I think a public hearing is probably the epitome of a forum into which you plug in an idea and get the public sense. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a good idea to do it. I'm, I'm not so sure you want to do this on every decision the council has, but on this one, uh, since we're going to eventually find finality, hopefully, out of this process in the near future, it's probably a good step to take. Yeah, yeah uh, I think everybody so. everybody involved, yeah. And uh, my, my, from reading a couple of the articles, it looked like uh, they were waiting to see if Sheridan was viable, and then when it became viable, it was, you know, they went with Sheridan without doing any public kind of uh, participation, where this now, a little late, but uh, really helps. We don't believe in representative government anymore. I mean, everybody's going to have to have their crack at this, and so we're going to have we're going to have hearings, <laughs> and we're going to have people's inputs. I mean, that's just that's just the the, the, the sign of the times, the culture we live in right now. I see where uh, Tom Baird is going to have listening sessions about what he should do for the city budget, and I'm sure when we get through this budget prioritization process that uh, Mayor Perez has been talking about. We're going to have meeting upon meeting. I know we, we can't make a decision to the Sheboygan Area School District without 25 committee meetings, so <laughs> why should city government be any different? Now, I, you know, I'm sensing just a tiny hint of cynicism oh, here, yeah. and uh, my goodness gracious. Now, representative democracy, yes, but if there's a sense that, that the electorate has that it can't be heard, and we have the, we, they do, they have, they're called elections. Well. And, and they happen pretty frequently in Wisconsin. And, but and probably just, not frequently enough. Yeah. And uh, I, I think on major issues, um, there's certainly nothing wrong with, uh, uh, with some public input, particularly if the folks have a sense that they're, that they're not being listened to. I think there's a, a spillover from the national scene as well. I think the numbers on the national scene are kind of interesting because George Bush uh, won more handily than some people thought. And, but you look at his popularity rating really, and the popularity of Congress, I mean, it is a, it's terrible. And I think some of it is that people are just simply saying um, the Shivo case and um, revisiting the war issue and the expenditure thereon um, in light of health care needs and other things that educational expenses and things that other people are, are, are grappling with on a local level, people are very disenchanted with their representative government on a national level. And I think that cynicism then just trickles down to the state and, and, and the local, whether it's justifiable in all cases. There's a cynicism out there that uh, the numbers on the national level uh, indicate is, is, is very deep. But isn't There's, there a... I, I have a little different take. The reason, mm -hmm. you know, the Bush administration, the Republican the Congress are willing to take on issues. And there's going to be multi-opinions on how one should proceed. And some issues get advanced one direction, one way, and people get upset with that. They think it's, that's not the way we should be doing things. And so when you take on issues, you're going to offend people, and, you're not, and then it's going to be exploited. Well, but let's get back just to the hearing business. <laughs> and local, the local. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, my, view, my view is simply that people, I think, <laughs> my take's a little bit even different than that, is I, th I don't think people feel that Washington, for whatever reasons, are very very responsive, and I don't I don't think people feel that their voice matters much in Long in Wisconsin, probably not even much in Madison much anymore, and so people I think want to have some control over their lives, some sense that their opinions matter, yep. some sense that I can have some input into something, and at the end of the day, my view mattered. And local government, whether it be uh, the the Sheboygan area school district or their local you know school district, or their local city government, is a place where people still can. Uh, see one another, go eyeball to eyeball, and talk, and that's. And I think there's you, a lot of appeal to that. Yeah. And couldn't you also argue that that's a, that's at least one level of government where how much money you have doesn't really 
make much difference in terms of how you get heard. Um, national parties aren't pouring tons of money into aldermanic races or mayoral races or, or sure. whatever. And so mm -hmm. people actually, I think, feel like, boy, at least I can go to whatever public hearing uh, or even call my alderman, but go to a public hearing and I, I can at least be heard. And I think there's a cynicism about even going to, to Madison. You know, you get a sense that, that, you know, there are public hearings and lots and lots of people come to, to testify, but the, the die has been cast, minds have already been made up, and that there really is no way to do reasonable, have any reasonable input. And in terms of election and as a referendum, again, if, if the money is driving it and you don't have enough money to get rid of incumbents, and we know that it's very difficult to, to, to oust an incumbent, you know, well, I don't think I don't think elections are, are necessarily the, 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 the referendum on, on on our officials that you, that you would hope they'd be. Clinton was brilliant at end running Congress. I mean, he went right to the people, and you know, various you know these town hall meetings and so forth, and it worked well for him. People in town Sheboygan, when they were discussing the Walmart issue, they were those concerned citizens were there, yeah. and they they the town's uh, board listened, uh, and they chose another course of action. And they still got elected, <laughs> sure. But the people got their input in, and they had an opportunity to express what they really thought. Yeah, yeah it's really kind of interesting what kinds of issues people get engaged in. Um, you know, the Walmart issue obviously is a directly going to impact people's lives in lots of different ways. So you got a lot of people showing up. I think the district had the Sheboygan Area School District had two, maybe three hearings on its budget, and I think maybe three people showed up, and it. Indifference, or whether they're so happy we're running the budget the way we are, is hard to say. But you know, it, this is. I know that we had uh, we had conversations earlier in the a couple of years ago about the dis uh, standards which students were supposed to be proficient in here at the local level, and we had hearings, and I think five or six people showed up. You know, so it's it's just interesting to see that sometimes you have these hearings, you want all this input, and nobody comes, and then sometimes you think you've made a decision which is pretty wise based on the best facts, and yeah. You know, when you don't, heck breaks loose. when you don't have the hearing, you yeah. effectively cut out anybody who wished to uh, speak. Yeah. But when you provide it, if they choose not to come, they can't complain. Yeah. <laughs> well, and woe betide the political leader who misjudges the interest that the that the public is going to have on a particular issue. Some budget hearings are mandated. County budget hearings, you know, you need to have X number of hearings in X number of places so the public is allowed to come and, and voice its opinion. I don't think the school district is required to, but by no. history it does and, and so forth. Um, so those are kind of routine sorts of things and not hot button issues for people. But then you get other, <laughs> you know, other issues where you think, well, this will just, I mean, who cares that Sheridan Park, I mean, we're saving the taxpayers money according to the people who voted for it. We don't need to get any input on that, I mean, you know, and so if you misjudge those things, at least at the local level, I think that's where the election is, the place where the, where the people can actually vote, you know, what their, what their thoughts are. All that said and done, it'll be so interesting from my perspective to see where that police station ends up. It sounds like it's still going to be 23. But um, another interesting but wrinkle. But you never know what happens at a, at a public input. Right. And, um, there's a referendum out there. Now, this is about the most quiet referendum. I saw it like in the third column of the, of the newspaper article. Um, there's a small group of people who have started a referendum petition to get the uh, question of, of, of the cost of the police station on the ballot. Do we want to spend $17 million on a police station? And my understanding is the debt limit will be structured so that the, count, or the city will not exceed its imposed 3% debt limit, although it's you know, bumped right up to the top there. But uh, I don't know how many signatures they got at this point, and it's supposed to be in, what, by August 1st soon, or something? Soon, soon. If and they I mean, don't have it by August yeah, 1, then it won't happen. But. Right. But, uh, I mean, that's awfully quiet. Uh, I mean, the various petitions that have been circulating around have been much noisier, but this one was pretty quiet. So... It'll be interesting to see what if uh, what if who's spearheading that. I don't know because I know I wasn't. You aware got of the it. you got that police thing. Tom is our keeper of uh, uh, newspaper keeper of records, articles. Yeah. <laughs> keeper of records. Got the, He's an educator, so he highlights it. In I yellow. think it might be yes. some of the Sheridan Park people. No, uh, there was a there was a gentleman that was listed on that little article on uh, 
police department. Mm -hmm. Oh, but I don't know. I don't know where I, what I did with it yeah. now. See? But uh, so it'll be interesting to see, because as much as we talk about the police station and where it's going to be located, then we're dealing with the the reality of. I mean, now the cost is 17 million, from 10 to 12 to 17 million, and so it's expensive. And how much will that mean for for the taxpayers and so forth? We haven't kind of crossed that next uh, that next mm -hmm. step, so it'll be interesting to see how that goes. What's going to happen if there's not a police liaison officer in the schools? Western civilization will end as we know it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a strong Robbie statement. <laughs> you know, I. Uh, Are you going to arrange for your own protection, or? No, no, no. Our, the, 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 our, the, 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 I've never felt unsafe over at South High School. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, we live in, a, in an age when you never know what's going to happen. Um, is it not, is it gr is it great? To, I should probably say when we talk about the district, I should do a disclaimer right away: is that this is my view and not the district's <laughs> position. That's almost always the case. But um, so I'm not speaking for the district. But I'm sure I'll get a telephone call from somebody from the district saying, "What are you doing, expounding on these things?" Um, it's it's a it's a nice, it's a good program. Um, I think there's a certain amount of people feel a certain amount of comfort level with an officer in the building if you have an officer there full time. Um, but you know, you're looking at budget prioritization processes, and you're looking at uh, having um, to make some tough decisions on the city budget, and and uh, so I'm I'm not surprised that it's on the radar for possible cuts or or elimination. Mm -hmm. um, An issue comes up is um, half funded by the city, half funded by right. the school system. You could argue, you could make a question, should it be totally funded by the school system and they contract with the, I mean, it's the same tax sure. dollars, but should you keep the lines of uh, demarcation clear that this is a school funded kind of activity? Uh, I still think it'll still be 50-50, uh, uh, but uh, maybe the uh, school system could raise some money through naming rights. <laughs> 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 to help fund this, because yep. it does yeah. say some of the money that if they raise, they could use in uh, funding some programs that might be earmarked for uh, uh, ending. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. isn't that a sign of the times, though? When we start with naming stadiums, now we're going to translate into naming government programs mm -hmm. after sponsors. <laughs> Government facilities. <laughs> I know, yeah. Well, it could be an endowed chair. Yes. Uh, yeah. but it would be an endowed uh, police vest or, you know, bulletproof yeah. vest or, or, or whatever. But, yeah, I am, um, I think it's, it's been a pretty good program for the, for the school district. But, again, it's costly. Um, the paper <clears throat> said uh, the cost is $375,000 a year and uh, for protection. And it, mm -hmm. that, that is a concern. As a former school board member, I can say that I remember hearing people talk about not necessarily so much the question of danger in the school as the officers being a good um, developing rapport with students and, and so forth. And, and typically, at least as far as I can remember, the officers do seem to do a, a, a good job of, of being your friendly police officer as opposed to mm -hmm. the, the uh, police officer that they... Uh, that, uh, is not so friendly, so it'll be interesting to see how that, to see how that turns out, and and what the district is going to do, and will we in fact just call police into the school districts when we need a specific police function? You know, somebody's disorderly, or there's a weapon, or something like that, and so it'll be interesting to see how that uh, how that's taken care of. Speaking of the police, I'm interested in your reaction to the um, press conference held by the district attorney and uh, uh, Chief Kirk of the Sheboygan Police Department regarding the Isaac Thomas complaint. Um, it is my understanding that the, um, I'm not sure if it was the Police and Fire Commission or just the Police Department which did its own internal investigation determined that there was, um, that there was no misconduct on the part of, um, of uh, police officers regarding the uh, incident where Mr. Thomas was pulled over. Um, now he's being charged, Isaac Thomas, with um, filing a false police report. Not a criminal charge, but a Class A misdemeanor, which, as I understand it, is the, uh, not misdemeanor, um, Class A forfeiture, which is the most serious forfeiture, fine up to $10,000. Um, 
What do you think? <coughs> Chilling effect on people complaining against the police? Uh, a reasonable uh, resolution of a difficult issue? What, what do you think? Well, when you have such a high profile case and you do find out somebody did indeed lie, um, I, I don't see how authorities can overlook that. Um, I, you know, I, I think uh, it remains to be seen what the case evolves into and what all the details are, but uh, if somebody did indeed falsify a report, uh, I think uh, people like the district attorney feel that they need to respond in some way. Mm -hmm. It's a negotiation tool. It's a negotiation tool. What's going to happen is probably um, both sides will probably step away from the thing and walk away. A civil suit that'll be, I mean, when you start weighing a, a civil suit against the city on the part of the plaintiff, and now the plaintiff is facing off um, this type of legal action, I imagine what's going to happen is uh, both sides will probably decide not to roll the dice. And mm -hmm. I, I think that'll be the way, that'll be my prediction here today. Mm -hmm. no, I'll only make one prediction today, besides <laughs> the end of Western civilization. <laughs> and that'll be that uh, both sides will probably recognize that uh, it's going to be a long, arduous process for both parties to try to figure out what actually happened out there in the street. And ultimately, unless somebody comes forward with more information or witnesses to tilt the evidence one way or the other. I'm not quite sure how it's going to, it's going to be a he said, he said. As often happens in these kinds of cases yeah. when you know, uh, citizens well, interact was, with yeah, the police. And, yeah, and, and one can understand that in its own internal investigation, which I think was quite thorough on the part of the police department, um, they determined from, from the police department's perspective that nothing improper happened. Um, and yet, yeah, as those of us who spend too much time in the courtroom, there are always two sides to the story, yeah. and it's always been my experience as a lawyer that except in the most cynical or unpleasant of situations, that both sides really think they're telling the truth. If I have a client who says, how can he lie when he says such and <coughs> such a thing? When people get into those circumstances, they really do believe they're telling the truth. So the officer feels he's telling the truth, Mr. Thomas feels he's telling the truth. The concern is the next step, which is not only does the police report uh, vindicate the police department, uh, which I don't have a problem with, but, but then the next step is taken, which is this, this gentleman, you know, when you've weighed the evidence and, and you've decided, no, there's no basis, but now we're going to go ahead and actually charge him. True, not with a crime, but with a, a, a fairly significant forfeiture action. Uh, it's, it just was interesting to me that it was that next step that was taken. And... Um, and I don't know what bargaining there's going to be. I don't know what this guy, Mr. Thomas, is going to do. Is he going to get a lawyer? Is he going to sue the city? The, I, you know, who knows? And it is one of those difficult, tricky situations from what I can just, as an outsider looking in, nobody will ever know what happened except the people who are there, and they have two distinctly different versions of the story. So I just, it's, it's an interesting time for Sheboygan. I, I mean, this kind of actual complaint and investigation process I, I think doesn't happen very much mm -hmm. and uh, as compared to Milwaukee which of course has had its share and in, in Madison yeah, and frequently have there been complaints against the police department uh, for abuse well, I, I'm it, not <coughs> in Sheboygan in yeah. particular I'm not well it's interesting because the Sheboygan press has made that open records request of all the law enforcement agencies in the county asking for uh, copies of all citizens complaints against officers for the last five years. That's a huge task. As I understand, as we're speaking now, most of the smaller law enforcement agencies have presented that material to the press, but the city has not, and I don't believe the sheriff's department has. And I mean, it's a big job. <laughs> Going back five mm -hmm. years is, is, it takes a lot of time and effort. So probably the press is entitled to that information under the open records law of the state, but still, that's, it's, it's quite a task. So I think at some point, if the press does push it, we'll find out how many complaints have been filed. And, and what kind. And what kind, and what the disposition has been, and, and, and so that'll be interesting. But uh, I did, from my perspective, the press, there was some difficulty with the conclusions that they jumped to in that particular article that for which they've now apologized a couple different times. but. Um, this is it's tricky stuff, mm -hmm. and you know, in changing communities uh, and, and neighborhoods, uh, I think we have to learn how to deal with that, with each other in a slightly different way than we used to. 
So we, and, and we so have, we have to, I think, be more multidisciplinary too. When uh, mm -hmm. the press got into the article on on differential arrest rates for different minority groups, <coughs> I mean, well, what you need to start bringing in is the whole issue of what groups are in poverty and what groups have higher crime rate because they're living in exactly. conditions that are not ideal. And, and those are type of things that have to be dragged in that oftentimes reporters just don't do that. So and, I I think think the, and I think the press has in fact apologized pretty much for yeah. having made some straight line conclusions yes. for data that really is all over the place and is yeah. hard to determine. So, well, let's just move on a little bit to naming rights. There's an editorial in the uh, Sheboygan Press uh, saying that uh, Selling the naming rights to, to public buildings is okay. University of Wisconsin Sheboygan has got several we could use named. Some, we could use some. We got well named buildings. Uh, Lakeland they, College. They, yeah. uh, it's a it's a fine old tradition, isn't it? Well, the uh, University of Wisconsin Sheboygan uh, it was is a first uh, because we had a private donor donate money for the building of the. The science building, uh, Bratz building, Bratz Foundation, and we now have Acuity uh, is also so. After one, then comes another, and uh, they're not just getting naming rights to the building; they're providing big chunks of money to the the building of the building, and the the, and the, the state then uh, uh, provides the money for putting all the uh, equipment into the building. So I don't have it, you know, I'm, I'm pleased that that's going on. Uh, we, uh, I, I guess an article came up about the naming rights of uh, when they were redoing Lambeau Field, they were, some people really objected to selling uh, Curly Lambeau's name or, you know, well, it should like, stay Lambeau Field. That's like Field changing because the, the American <coughs> flag, flag design. I mean, I, <laughs> I but Certain I. Certain things will not, ta not tamper with. <laughs> Some things exactly. you don't tamper with. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, maybe that's the point. Some things uh, yeah. you just can't tamper with. And others, uh, there's no, no big issue. As long as there are private donors who support education or private donors who support uh, certain things and they wish to make a contribution, I think it's a, a positive. Yeah, I, I, I guess I can't see... Uh, it, it, when we're in an, uh, an atmosphere where support for public education, fi uh, mm -hmm. government support for public education is, is, there's certainly no great leaps forward as far as that goes. I think it's uh, looking for private support for this kind of thing. I don't know, to me it makes sense. And, and I think it reflects the people who are important in the community. I mean, look at Lakeland College. I think every building it's has named for is named for someone, and certainly in the university That's tradition. That's a private school, though, versus yeah. a public school. Yeah. yeah, but I mean, University of Wisconsin Madison. Every building is named after not every building, but many buildings are named after private donors. So, um, I happen to sit on the board of the Sheboygan Public Education Foundation, just to make that disclosure. And and uh, but I can't get fired from that. I don't think. <clears throat> Nor can I. <laughs> um, it's it's an enthusiastic group of community volunteers yeah. who have a you know an entrepreneurial edge, mm -hmm. and uh, so I think, from my perspective, boy, the the more the merrier as as far as that goes. I don't see any really significant significant down. Sides. I so think I, there has to be some ground rules. Um, I think it, it kind of all began with uh, certain beverage companies putting up uh, scoreboards oh, yes, and yes, whether they right. then get an exclusive contract for the district when they sell beverages, mm -hmm. soft drink beverages uh, at their events, whether there can be then any competition. I think those are type of ethical questions that need to be spelled out because uh, right. we appreciate gifts and community participation, but uh, government's not in the business of granting monopolies. Exactly. Well, then you exactly. had, then you had uh, earlier on, I don't think these enterprises are, are, have been found to be that much successful. They were offering to put in uh, closed circuit uh, televisions exactly, throughout yeah. the schools and, and, and return for which the students would have to watch uh, yeah. a syndicated television program. Of course, there was going to be all sorts of commercials being thrown at them within the school setting. Yeah, and, uh, and, and that gets to be a, a little yeah. bit... Yeah. But I think that's distinctly different than a naming right to a right. building. And yeah, right. one of my first decisions on the school board back in 1996 was whatever soft drink company was going to give a gift to the district of a scoreboard mm -hmm. in exchange for exclusive vending mm -hmm. contract rights. And, and it, this is not a gift. You know, we need to figure out if this is a good deal for the district. And, and I mm -hmm. think our school district has been pretty good 
about making sure that those kinds of things are evaluated. And, and As that goes forward, uh, I saw that the, Sh the, the Sheboygan Public Education Foundation was going to be involved in making decisions. How have they got to a point where they might uh, decide how they're going to do it? I mean, would you like a private industry like McDonald's or Wendy's wanting their name on a building or something? I mean, how are you going to make a decision on what names to allow and not allow? That's what you were talking about. I think part of it is um, there aren't necessarily groups that are jumping out to spend millions of dollars on buildings um, so that there's some hustle involved, you know, some selling, some pitching of the, of the project to, to various industries. It's my understanding, however, that the school district and specifically the school board will retain, and rightfully so, will retain com final decision-making authority about whether they're going to allow that to happen. Okay. Uh, you know, if, if the Education Foundation finds a terrific donor for $2 million, but the school district and specifically the board is not in favor of it, they'll have the, the final say, which is, I, I mean, absolutely, I think that's, that's how it has to be. Briefly, before we're wrapping up, we're in the schools. Reading scores are up for third graders, uh, still below the state average. Um, this is kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, we do very well. We never talk about when we're looking at Sheboygan scores, how many of our children don't speak English? And so they are, <coughs> and they're folded into this. Uh, I think the school district is doing a great job. I mean, we look and say, oh, we're three or four points below the state average, but uh, when 33% is it now of your children right. are minority children, many of whom do speak English, but many of whom do not, I think we're doing pretty good. Yeah, and then the increase, uh, not only this, the, the influx of ELL and other English language learners and those things, but also, as we talked about a couple of the episodes back a couple months ago, the larger number of uh, students who come from what the state labels economically disadvantaged uh, families is has been really kind of the hidden secret that nobody much talks about. We've been focusing on race, but that's part of it. Progress is being made, and when you get to about 1 or 2%, by the way, you know this isn't fine tuning. One or two percent of uh, on a test like this is within the margin of error. So you're pretty close to the state average. And the good news is is that the, the schools that have those types of families that struggle, um, Sheridan, Longfellow, uh, Washington, they're the ones that are making reasonably good progress. It's the schools that have traditionally not had those types of populations. Now they're there, and now teachers have to adjust and change practices. That's, that's the next challenge I think the district's going to face. Yeah, and I think that uh, uh, so many of our children really uh, you know, are, are in that spot. Time is gone. It's been a pleasure, and we'll talk again soon.